I was going to introduce Baruchi to everyone, but I think we all know him dearly, both as a friend, as a colleague, as a deep thinker. Uh, so Baruchi will be presenting for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll take questions. And then uh, he'll put us, the committee, into breakout rooms. Uh, Dr. Raleigh, Dr. Cordera, Dr. Carini. We'll discuss how well he's done. The rest can stay and just uh, enjoy the time with Baruti. And I do want to echo what Baruti said, Dr. Raleigh, about what you've added to his dissertation. It would have been incomplete without you and without your comments. So Baruti, I hand the gavel back to you and enjoy. And we're recording. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Dr. Maparian, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate your energy today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. The title of the dissertation is The Experience of Pure Consciousness as Described Within Maharshi Vedic Science and Expressed Among Secular Thought and Life Systems. And what I'd like to do for a few minutes is to really discuss an overview, context, and a hypothesis that kind of guided the research. Overview. Um, as many of you know, I'm a Freemason. I have been a Mason. I was raised 18 August 2009 in Fairfield, Iowa at Clinton Lodge Number 15. I was introduced, however, to Freemasonry in 1993, but it wasn't until much later that I recognized that Freemasonry has always been a part of my life. And that's because my grandfather was a Prince Hall Freemason, I later learned, and learned that from my mom, who shared with me that my grandfather, I was going to Grand Lodge for some event, and my mother says to me, well, you know, your granddad was a Mason as well. And the moment she said that, everything is, it settled in my awareness, and I completely understood him much more fully. And when she said that, she shared also too with me that she and my, my grandmother was Eastern star and my mother would have to always visit these cotillions and hated wearing dresses. My mother's not a dress woman. <laughs> so <laughs> she, wore, she would please in pantsuits. And so she shared with me about my grandfather. He was a Mason. And so at that point I, point, I realized Freemasonry has always been a part of my journey. Now, the context in terms of the research comes out of the fact that the night I was raised, 18 August 2009, it was a Tuesday, I'd gone back to my dorm and I'd gone to bed. Falling asleep, I had a nighttime experience. I don't call it a dream, I call it an experience because this man comes to me in this dream this experience he had a dark black suit, a crisp white shirt and a black tie. And he asks me, have you figured out what Freemasonry is yet? And I said to him, in essence, that it seems that the ritual is infused with ancient precepts and principles that are here for present and future generations. And as Masons, as this thing called Freemasonry is a repository for these ideas, we who go through this process have to then serve as exponents of this knowledge in the world around us. No, not for bad, but definitely for good. And to make sure this information remains present within the world itself. And so... That struck me as being just this powerful experience that always stuck with me. I then, when I was deciding on what I wanted to research, I started thinking about my own experiences of a mystical nature, not just what happened in 2009, but what also happened in 1993 after I'd been introduced to a text by another Freemason who made me, rec he recommended a book. He then made me uh, commit to securing that book for study. I did so. I saw him a year later that fall on campus. And he says to me, young man, have you secured the book? I said, yes, sir. He said, did you study the book? I said, yes, sir. He said, what were your results? I said, where do I even begin? And he says, good. Let's talk again sometime. That's the second time that phrase was used to me. Good. Let's talk again sometime. The first was with him. The second was with the man in 2009 after the night I was raised in my dream state. And so I began thinking about the ritual. I got involved with the lodge and began serving as a lodge officer. My initial role was a senior deacon. And senior deacon is responsible for working with the worshipful master to conduct new candidates and guide them through the ritual to have a similar experience. And I recall my own experiences and going through the ritual, contemplating the ritual, I quickly realized that there are many ways to experience the ritual. One, as a candidate receiving the degree work and symbols within a ritual. Two, as a ritualist or brother delivering the ritual. Three, as a sideline brother witnessing the ritual in action. Four, as a brother contemplates the ritual within the privacy of one's mind away from a tiled lodge. 
and fifth as one lives the ritual and its symbols in daily life. So those are the five material ways the Zaman ritual may be experienced. And so as I began to recognize that, I began to wonder if other Masons were having similar experiences that I was having. Now, bear in mind, too, at this time, I've been practicing Transcendental Meditation for about a year and a half. And so I, I figured that maybe my experiences were augmented by my practice of Transcendental Meditation. And so out of that experience came the hypothesis of wondering, you know, was there more to Freemasonry that existed beyond these values of the fraternal or the philanthropic? Because most often people give attention to the fraternal and the philanthropic. And I looked at the philosophic and was drawn to it and was wondering if there was more to the experiences of other Masons, not just myself. And so I began to look more deeply into it and recognized that you have the fraternal, you have the philanthropic, and you have the philosophic. And this gets back to the three tenets of Freemasonry, which are brotherly love, relief, and truth. Brotherly love is a fraternal, relief is the philanthropic, and philosophic is the aspect of truth. And the truth in the sense of going beyond the mere surface values. We talk about it in Vedic science as satyam eva jayate, truth alone triumphs. And so delving into it from that perspective. And so I would wonder, you know, does Freemasonry offer any lasting value beyond the fraternal and the philosophic? And if so, what are those values? And if those values exist, how have current Freemasons come to believe they never, they don't exist and never did exist within the craft itself? And so that kind of guided my push to understand my own experiences, but wonder if other men, in this case, Freemasons, were having similar experiences. And so what we did, we had, let me come back here. We actually put our call for respondents on several Facebook groups asking if other Masons have had similar experiences. And we put out the call for respondents. We had it up for four weeks and every day, every week at the same time, same date, uh, at the same time you're on that date, submitted it. And we closed it down at 11.59 on that, at the end of that fourth week. We collected over 300 respondents after data culling and data scrubbing is referred to, we actually have 148 Freemason respondents. The research initially was to be focused on Freemasons and Rosicrucians. However, due to the paucity, only 36 uh, Rosicrucians responded, 15 supplied detailed experiences of the mystical experiences. We focused this research on mystical experiences among Freemasons. And so of that 148, 90 of them supplied detailed accounts of their mystical experiences. And what follows is a discussion on those numbers. But before I do that, I'd like to give a ground, a ground set, if you will, of information. And I want to talk about the three lodges. The three layers of meaning of the lodge are the internal lodge, the external lodge, and the universal lodge. The internal lodge is the mind. This is where we do most of our work, where that work is done without sound. It's the, the internal work that we engage in. You may hear of it in other contexts as the great work. The great work is done within to be reflected then without. So it's the mind. The external lodge is the lodge where Masons meet to study, to learn, and also to, to make, make, make new Masons to guide them along this perfecting path. And the Universal Lodge is the world itself, where in which we travel. We often refer to it as being part of our several stations in life. And so wherever we go throughout the world, we are within the Universal Lodge itself. So again, we have the Internal Lodge, which is the mind, the External Lodge, which is, again, a lodge of tiled masons that are meeting specifically to engage the ritual and to, of course, make new masons, and the Universal Lodge being that of the world in which we travel itself. Now... In terms of the subjects and procedure, we administered Dr. Hood, uh, Dr. Ralph Hood of UT Chattanooga. He had a measure developed in 1975 called the M scale, called the Mystical Experiences Scale. It's a 32 item questionnaire that is devised with 16 positive questions and uh, 16 negative questions, total of 32, to get at people's experiences, to understand what's happening. And so he developed this measure and he was kind enough to actually send me the measure. I, I came to me in a meditation. Uh, this was 2017 as I was beginning this research uh, in terms of the, after the, the, after the def, uh, defense of the proposal and came to me in a meditation. I couldn't find it anywhere online. I couldn't find it in any of the articles I was reading. And my mind said, why don't you contact Dr. Hood? 
And I said, oh, that's a novel idea. So I come out of the meditation after it's done and I call and my mind says, I left him a voicemail. My mind says, well, send him an email. And I sent him an email and he replied to the email within an hour. And he says, I'll be at my office at 6.30 a.m. tomorrow, pick a time and let's talk. In the interim, I later learned he did his research on me to wonder who I was and what was I doing. And he then said to me, I like what you're doing. I love the fact of the, the topic of the research because it hasn't been done yet. And I think it's an important aspect of the research to contribute to mystical experiences research. He then says, I'm going to send you several articles, a book, and the measure itself. He does so. And he tells me how to code the measure to get the responses correct. So I don't have to do a bunch of stuff on the back end. So he sends that to me. And again, after that was done, it yielded 148 respondents and 90 of whom we'll talk about in a moment provided detailed accounts of mystical experiences. And I'll share three of those. We have the multivariate test that was done. And so we see here that in terms of the, the data that was produced, we know that it's statistically significant with regard to uh, all of the, the outcomes. The key component, however, which intrigued me was the one sample statistics test where with positive affect, we have a mean of 6.174 of the 148 respondents. And then of course, religious quality, you have 6.5693. And it highlights that the, the mean is significant in terms of the respondents, what they've provided in terms of the 32 item questionnaire. On the one sample t-test, which I thought was pretty interesting, is the noetic quality. That, that quality we learned from William James in terms of kind of just something is happening, gnosis is coming through. The, the number was rather significant with regard to the 140 respondents. We also noticed a high number with regard to positive affect and also too with religious quality as well. And so we find that Freemasons are definitely experiencing something. We don't know if it's because of the ritual solely. We don't know if it's because of, we'll talk about it in a moment, of them being, you know, just, you know, at a point in their life to be able to kind of contemplate things. They are more established in their lives. You know, it, it's a question of, you know, what is it? I believe part of it can be explained by the ritual. Again, they're experiencing the ritual, not only as a candidate, but in those other ways as well, and they're contemplating their experiences. And we, we know that as you repeat something with the brain, we know that the areas that are associated with particular physical phenomena enlarge. We know that for a fact because uh, Dr. Travis, in one of his classes when we were in graduate school, he shared the research on the primate who had its index finger stroked. And that index finger being stroked, you would initially see areas of the brain that would fire. But over time, at specific intervals, those areas would enlarge, which highlight that something is happening physiologically to the primate. But internally, with regard to the brain, the brain is using more of the, of the regions that are associated with that experience to, to really just to, to process it, if you will. I suspect something similar is happening with regard to the ritual. Again, it comes back to repetition. Anyone who's a good ritualist will tell you they only became a good ritualist by virtue of practice, constantly just going through the words. And not only at some point, the words themselves, you come to own the ritual. It becomes a part of you as you move forward. And so the idea is that there's something happening within Freemasons, the brain in this case, a constant repeated exposure to the ritual that is causing them to have a specific experience. I say that because what we do know is that the more you repeat something, the stronger the connections within the brain that are associated with that experience, they become. And as a result of that, it becomes a default way of being within the world itself. And so Freemasonry, the idea behind it is to take good men and make them better. And part of that, Joseph Fort Newton says, not better than another, but better than it could have been on their own. And so we do so in community. This gets into the fraternal aspect of the craft. We've heard the phrase iron sharpens iron. And so in community with other Masons, in this case, those who are potentially having mystical experiences or want to delve deeper into the side of the craft that is the philosophical side to delve deeply into it, we recognize that something is happening within the brain itself. I, I strongly suspect something is happening in terms of the connections due to the experiences that are being had. Now, of those 148, that was the SPSS portion in terms of the research. We did it and did two things. We did qualitative and quantitative. That was the quantitative, and now this is the qualitative. 
we used Atlas TI. Uh, Dr. Travis introduced me to Atlas TI. And I, I then took the 90 responses, copied and pasted them into Atlas TI, and it gives you the opportunity to, to code them. Initially, I sought to code them using uh, Evelyn Underhill's five-part classification, The Mystic Way, and uh, William James' four-part classification. Dr. Travis recommended open coding, and he said it allowed for more to come through as you contemplate what the passages really mean, you kind of just think about them, and deep, deeply think about them. So I did this over the course of, I want to say it was close to three or four weeks, almost a month, just kind of just thinking about various passages, which I'm going to share three of them in a moment, which really stick out in terms of the experiences. But going through this process and coming up with the super codes, it was, it was revelatory for me because it had me think about even my own experiences. And it had me think about questions as a Masonic education person guiding you know, other Masons through this process within the district a few years ago. It had me think about conversations that I had with them and recognizing that there are in fact, you know, Masons who are having experiences, not just myself, which I initially thought mistakenly, of course, that was the case. And so I am going to share three experiences that Masons provided. The first of which comes from respondent number F4166. What I did and how I derived those numbers within SurveyMonkey, it randomly generates a, a long string number. And so what I did, I, I took the last four of that string and I fixed an F for Freemasons and an R for Rosicrucians to demarcate who was what in, in terms of the, the survey respondent. So three experiences. The first Mason says, on the 25th anniversary of my fellow craft degree, I was honored to present the middle chamber lecture to two brothers in my mother lodge. Now the middle chamber lecture is a long form lecture where it highlights many aspects of Freemasonry that one, when experiencing it as a candidate, it's like drinking you know, water from a fire hose. You can't experience it but one time. You have to experience it many times to really grok, to use Heinlein's term, what it really means in its significance. He then goes on to say, after the first few minutes of delivering the lecture, I became aware that it was just me and the two brothers in the lodge. We were as one. I was in the zone, if you will. This sense stayed with me throughout the lecture. This is the example that stands out in my mind, but this was not the first time or last time I had the experience. He goes on to say, the peace and calm that I felt when I completed that part was euphoric. I had the sense that during that time, I was truly with the grand architect of the universe. Now, the grand architect of the universe, for those who may not know, is emblematic of God. We use the term the grand architect or the great architect of the universe. The second respondent, this is uh, F9125. He says, on several occasions, I have had a deep sense of standing in unity with those who have gone before and the divine, of my hands moving in unison with the will of the long line of men who have been in my, previously, my position previously. There was a moment at the first occasion in which I was master of the lodge and made a mason. When my hand touched the hand of the candidate and everything seemed to stop. It was like reality flickered for a second and there was an overwhelming sense of peace. It was in the midst of ritual that I was responsible for performing and yet I suddenly had no anxiety about remembering the words. I was filled with a deep wonder at the timelessness and truly sacred nature of what was happening. I felt like every previous master of my lodge had his hand on my shoulder and was present in the room. It was at once very reassuring and very intimidating, even though that combination of emotions makes no sense. He goes on to say, when I was high priest of a chapter, this is the Royal Arch degree, this is one of the appendant bodies within Freemasonry. And he says, I was high priest of a chapter. I was presiding over a Royal Arch degree and observing from the east, which is where the master, or in this case, the high priest sits within the lodge itself, as the candidates approached the east for the first time. I could say the room vanished from my view and was replaced by something that seemed a perfected version of itself. Let's see someone else is joining. Let's get them in here. 
But that wouldn't be accurate, although it would be true. It's hard to put into words a sudden sense of the perfect nature of what lay behind the event that was happening. There was this sense that what was happening was calling on something that lay just behind and beyond our perception, that our reality for a moment touched reality. And he distinguishes here, he says, reality in lowercase, our reality, and he uses the uppercase R for reality, touched reality. My breath caught, and the person sitting next to me noticed and touched my hand, asking if I was okay. It was gone as quickly as it had come. But that sense, that memory of having seen it, has stayed with me. The image in my mind is so present and preternaturally clear. As usual, trying to express the ineffable makes me sound like a madman or an idiot. This last brother, he uh, F1318, I think is really special. This is why I left him for last because it speaks directly to transcendental meditation. He says here, 42 years ago, I was instructing my grandfather in the technique of transcendental meditation. After him learning the very first day, he turned to me and said, you have to become a member of the Masonic tradition. I said, why? And he told me that he understood exactly what I just told him to do. And he said very clearly, you've taught me to experience transcendental consciousness. He said, further, I've been a Mason for over 55 years, and I have studied, experienced theoretically of what the transcendent, of what the perfect triangle was like. And in those first few minutes of learning to meditate, he said that he did experience firsthand the fulfillment of the intellectual understanding he had spent for the, he had for the last 50 plus years studying during the tradition of Masonic instructors before him. On the basis of that conversation, 20 years later, I decided to become a Mason. Upon entering the different degree work of becoming a Master Mason, it was quickly revealed to me that the knowledge of transcending has permeated throughout the fraternity of Freemasonry. Those are but three examples from respondents of the 90 accounts that we have that collected from the subsequent question at the very end of the call for respondents in the in the M scale in the M scale survey, asking men the servants rather uh, Freemasons to provide a detailed account of their mystical experience and, and provide as much information as they recall. Those are but three, and there are other such experiences that indicate strongly that there are Freemasons throughout the world who are having experiences of a mystical nature. And I, I say throughout the world because we have a total of 15 countries, U.S. represented as well in terms of the research, 14 are abroad, and it's amazing to look at the breadth and depth of men who responded to this survey. I say men because while Freemasons have existed since 1725 that are women as well in, in England and other parts of the world, one great book that I recommend is The Brotherhood of Freemason Sisters by Dr. Lilith Mahmoud. She was actually a speaker in 2000. We invited her in 2015, I believe it was, to serve as keynote speaker here uh, at the Academic Convocation of Masonic Lodges. And she did a wonderful presentation. And I have a copy of her book and have read through it and highlights that women are also Freemasons as well. I do know that there is uh, a lodge in Washington, D.C. I know the man, he's a past Grand Master in D.C. His wife happens to be over that, uh, that group as well. And so I do know that there are women Freemasons in the United States. And as to whether they're having similar experiences, I don't know. I suspect they are, however, because as I understand it, the ritual is the same. And it, it would be interesting to, to actually conduct some research to find out more. But those are three experiences that came out of the 90 that we have in terms of the research. Uh, now, what I'd like to do is to spend a few moments discussing uh, the Riksha Akshare verse that Maharshi is, comes from the Rig Veda, and it's an amazing verse. And I'll tell the story behind why this verse is so personal to me at the conclusion, if anyone would like to hear it. But it's Risha Akshare Parame Vyoman Yasmin Deva Arivishve Deshadu Yastana Veda Kimricha Karashati Yai Tad Vidus Taime Samasate. 
And Maharshi translates it as the verses of the Veda exist in the collapse of fullness, the kshara of ah, in the transcendental field, self-referral consciousness, the self in which reside all the devas, the impulses of relative intelligence, the laws of nature responsible for the whole manifest universe. He whose awareness is not open to this field, what can the verses accomplish for him? Those who know this level of reality are established in evenness, wholeness of life. Now, I, I was tasked with taking this verse and trying to understand it from a Masonic perspective. And as I went back and forth, kind of contemplating and refining, this is what has come out of that. And it reads thus, the principal tenets of Freemasonry, brotherly love, relief, and truth, again, fraternal, philosophic, fraternal, philanthropic, and philosophic, and their deeper values can be observed in action when the rituals are fully embraced and deeply experienced during the initiation through the degrees and contemplated afterward as applicable to daily, to daily life via an open heart and mind which in, which in, in which reside all the knowledge to employ the tools required for inner unfoldment. These tools are the basis by which the evolving Mason comes to live life more fully, not only for oneself, but also for the larger community, serve for its advancement in an unselfish manner. For the Mason who does not have an open heart and mind, one cannot live a life of service to a calling as one does not know the resident possibilities within one's being. Those Masons possessive of a fully open heart and mind come to see the totality as expressed, not only within oneself, but also within the whole of each person with whom one comes into contact. A result is that deep compassion develops and allows service to be rendered where and when needed without need of recognition. For in the end, when aiding another, one also aids oneself. And here, the word another is put in quotes because there really isn't truthfully, when you think about it, it's just consciousness. It's just us as humans. And that quote that comes from Rumi where he says, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there's a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, languages, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. So what we're highlighting there in terms of the craft is that it, it points to, the rituals point to what we refer to in Vedic science as pure consciousness. It, it points to that fundamental aspect of everyone and everything. And what we come to understand, those of us who are contemplating the ritual of Masonic ritual deeply, we recognize that we're one under the canopy of heaven as humans. And under the canopy of heaven, there should be no lines of demarcation amongst brothers. Sadly, there historically has been, and this gets into the wonderful contributions from Dr. Rowley regarding Prince Hall Freemasonry. And when I read through Dr. Morant's, Reverend Morant's sermon from uh, 17, uh, 90, 1787, and then 89 rather, 1789, and then reading through Prince Hall's two charges from 1792 and 1797, we're talking late 17th, 18th century. And these men had a profound understanding of their fundamental humanness, their, their spiritual aspect. They understood it. This gets into something that we read from Thurman in his book, uh, Jesus and the Disinherited, which Dr. King carried with him and was an early reader of it, that he talks about how there has to be a, a, a surgery has to be performed on the psyche of the disinherited. You, get, you have to un remove this way of thinking about oneself as being less than. And for the person who then serves a capacity of the disinherited, you walk into the world understanding your fullness as a spiritual being under the canopy of heaven within the universe itself, possessive of this ability to have a fundamental experience, you come to serve as a point of light. And in serving as a point of light, you then reverberate this into the world around you. And so the Ritual Akshare verse allowed me to delve deeply into my own experiences, those experiences that I've come to understand from the respondents that, again, we are, in fact, under the canopy of heaven. This does, in fact, point to something that's fundamental and present and resident within everyone and everything. And we need only give it attention. And what I like to do is to pivot 
to the unified field chart. And this is something I think is important because Maharshi, you know, I, I know there are students on campus historically who would see the unified field chart and wonder, is it applicable to every academic discipline? And I can say definitively it is, number one, and being tasked with the responsibility of examining it in terms of Freemasonry, it was really powerful because it, it took me and it had me go through deeply the ritual and my own understanding of it to present this information as a path, if you will. And what came out of it was we all are familiar with the unified field chart that Maharshi developed going from the state of self-referral consciousness of pure consciousness from the subtle to the gross. And as you see the juxtaposed, what we came to refer to as the model for perpetual growth and progress, I want to give a shout out to Right Worship of Michael Jarzebek, who helped me develop that name, uh, my mentor at the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, because you move from the subtle to the gross. And it was really powerful as Dr. Travis and I were working, as I was typing all this stuff into the various like, I, you know, the, the panels, the rudimentary uh, model at first. And as it was unfolding, it was just, my mind was just going in multiple directions as we were working on this. But this has come out of it. And so I'm going to go to a larger version of it. So as we have here, the model for perpetual growth and progress, we begin, we begin at the three in one structure of consciousness. We know that everything emerges from consciousness itself. We have the knower, the process of knowing, and the known. And these three columns will become evident as we move forward. So in reviewing the unified field chart as developed by Maharshi Mahesh Yogi and the model for perpetual growth and progress alongside for contemplation, we note the wisdom as posited by Maharshi Mahesh Yogi that every discipline or field of study may be discovered to emerge from and thus have its roots within the unified field, thus highlighting that as keen minds move the attention in an inward direction, as is evident with the regular practice of the transcendental meditation technique, the likelihood increases that one will, via deep, consistent study, necessary action, and an evolving sense of self, find oneself aligned with the laws of nature to the point of discovering and committing to a higher purpose or calling for the benefit of many more than would otherwise be possible without said combination as part of one's Masonic education. And as one closely examines the model for perpetual growth and progress, one is able to see oneself within the model to determine next steps for additional advancement via the symbols and lessons of each as presented within Masonic ritual in accordance with one of the five ways one may experience and observe the ritual, as we mentioned. As a candidate, as a ritualist, a brother delivering the ritual, as a sideline brother witnessing the ritual, as one contemplates the ritual away from a tiled lodged in the privacy of one's mind, and as one lives the ritual in daily life. In progressing through the model, one soon realizes that while knowledge, understanding, and refinement are gained along the way, one will ever remain a student of any new area of knowledge approached. However, with deep commitment to the undertaking at hand, one emerges the better as the journey continues until the last breath is expended from one's lungs upon transition. In short, and if we may be allowed to strongly posit, one will ever remain a student, though a conscious one. Hence, the perpetual aspect of both the journey and the proposed model. So as we go through the model, and this model, I must say, it doesn't, it, it has universal applications, whereas if we were to remove the second tier, I'll talk about it in a moment, where it says Masonic education, incorporating TM and evolving Mason, all one need do to make it fit with their organization is in the case of a professional setting or within the case of a secular thought and life system beyond that of Freemasonry, just switch those two panels and the model has universal applications. So as we move through the model, we have the three one structure of consciousness as to discuss the fraternal, philomathy, and philanthropic levels, which when taken together, we also refer to as philosophic fraternitatis. Moving through the right, from the right to the left at each tier, we note the first tier consists of, come here, we note the first tier consists of the panels labeled knower, process of knowing and known. They denote the three one structure of pure consciousness as posited by Maharshi and discussed within the Vedic tradition as espoused by many early and modern thinkers. This tier may be thought of as fundamental as it gives rise to all phenomena and may be rightly thought of as the abode of all 
and from which all emerges, especially the human mind, as encased within the physiology, and is thus capable of seeking to know more and thus be and become more. The second tier, the second tier, consisting of the panels labeled Seeker of Knowledge, Masonic Education, and Evolving Mason, moving from left to right, highlights the importance of both the necessity of, at a bare minimum, being a seeker, willing to undertake Masonic education as a result of exposure to the symbols and knowledge present within the ritual among the five ways as previously mentioned. In addition to one's ongoing contemplation thereon, as well as the study of the texts of those Masonic authors worthy of the appellation, the result as depicted within this tier evinces an evolving Mason and becomes apparent to all with eyes to see and ears to hear. The third tier consisting of the panels labeled desire of the heart, deep consistent study and compassion for everyone illustrates that as Masons, we are first made so within our hearts. As said experience and process involves that subtle desire, which serves as the catalyst for the required deep consistent study, which allows, which then allows the one undertaking said study, in this case, that of the ritual, to develop compassion for everyone as we are all under the canopy of heaven, or stated differently, each is possessive of the spark of creative potential that is the direct inheritance from nature itself as we are a part of the same. The fourth tier, consisting of panels contemplation, self-realization, and acceptance of change, highlights the path of one's mind as one contemplates the ritual and one's inner landscape to arrive at a deeper, more profound understanding of what it means to be a conscious human. In sum, this tier highlights that eventually one comes to, fun to be fundamentally aware of the source of one's being. And as a result, the acceptance thereof in all, in all the iterations, it may be considered a crucial point of departure from prior limited ways of thinking. I say that because as, who is it, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the judge, uh, the, the dad, not the judge, he says, once a man's mind is stretched by a new idea, it never returns to its original dimension. So once you have an experience, in this case, a mystical experience, you begin to recognize that fundamentally you are more than the sum of your parts. You may have known it intellectually, but now you know it experientially. And that then kind of draws you in to kind of move forward and continue to learn. The fifth tier gets then into, it consists of necessary action, redefined life purpose and an evolving sense of self. It draws attention to the importance of doing that which is known as being essential or necessary for continued growth and refinement in the direction of refined purposes of one's life, which may look wholly different than the previous trajectory and allows each of us to fully embrace the attendant of evolution of self. So have the necessary action, redesign, redefine life purpose and an evolving sense of self. So this evolving sense of self is important because you have to be embracing of that reality that you're going to evolve and to surrender the things of youth as the Christian text tell us to embrace the, the, the things of wisdom we, you can't unsee these things. Once you have this experience, you can act as if you didn't have the experience or if you didn't learn the lesson, but nature has a way of, how shall we say, <laughs> repeating these experiences if we don't learn the lessons. And so the moment we accept the fact that we are evolving, that we are growing and behave as such, we can then go on to the next lesson. As long as we have breath in our lungs, we're going to be learning lessons. And how often a lesson repeats itself is going to be dependent upon how quickly we accept the change and recognize the evolving sense of self. And so as we move to the, the sixth tier with execution, keep your eyes on the prize and commitment to a higher purpose or calling, it speaks to the importance of acting in accordance with the blueprint we have created that has been designed to produce a desired outcome. So it's important for us to recognize that when we have a specific, you know, task that needs to be executed, we have to do it. And I often like it, often liken it to working out. I work out, I ride three times a week. I do weights three times a week. And there are some mornings, this morning I woke up and did an hour long ride. There are mornings I don't want to ride. I do not want to get on the bike and I don't want to ride. There are mornings I don't want to do 35 minutes or 40 minutes or 45 minutes of weights, but I do it. 
I do it because I know how I'm going to feel afterward. For example, even getting up in the morning to meditate, I tell people all the time, you want to fold it into your day and you do so by getting up in the morning, meditate first thing in the morning. It can be after your morning ablutions. You want to do it before you have your coffee. You want to meditate in the afternoon to allow the brain to do what it's designed to do. And if you do this, developing these habits, James Clear talks about this in his book, Atomic Habits, that if you have this foundation, you know what it's going to provide for you, you just do it. And so when we talk about execution, execution is important because one can know what to do and choose not to do it. You're not going to get any results. But if you know what to do and you do it, even if you don't want to do it, here I'm thinking of musicians, proficient musicians who practice daily and may not want to practice daily, but they practice anyway because they know that they're going to get better. And as in practicing, you become better. As with the ritual, as we contemplate the ritual, we can't but become better. And so it's important to keep our eyes on the prize. And so here it says, additionally, this final tier allows us to test the newly acquired focus that the panel titled commitment to a higher that the panel titled commitment to a higher purpose or calling indicates. One does so with increased facility. And while this may appear as the final rung on the ladder for one's growth and evolution, it must ever be borne in mind that as one embarks on any new enterprise as related to growth and evolution, one may at each new undertaking be considered a seeker all again and thus capable of traversing the cycle in perpetuity. So we're constantly learning, we're constantly growing, and we have to be okay with that process because it doesn't end once we learn a new task, once we learn a new language, we're constantly learning as we move through, in this case, the model itself. So this is the model for perpetual growth and progress. And what I like to do also too is to describe the ascending aspects of the model. So you have your knower column, seeker of knowledge, desire of the heart, contemplation, necessary action, and execution. This is what the knower must do. And the process is we have to, you know, Masonic education in our case here, incorporate transcendental meditation, deep, consistent study, engage in self-realization because you, you engage in study, you're going to learn who and what you are. That's going to lead you to define, redefine life purpose. You may have wanted to, for example, uh, be a gardener, but then again, you realize, okay, I like gardening, but this idea is taking me in a different direction. So I want to follow that direction. I liken that to when I learned TM. I wasn't to begin my academic study at MIU until the fall of 2009. And sitting in a coffee shop by cam on campus near Morehouse, my mind says, move up your date of admissions from the fall of 2009 to this fall. I didn't think I could get rid of my flat. This was 2008, mind you. I couldn't get rid of my flat. I didn't think it was going to happen quickly. I called Ela. She was my ad advisor. And I said, I wanted to move up my date of admissions. What's involved? Just let me know. She'd fast track my application. She did so. And throughout that process, I kept focusing on, I wanted to be in Fairfield. I wanted to begin this graduate program in Maharshi Vedic Science. So I kept my eyes on the prize. And it wasn't until I learned on 29 July, one day before my birthday, that I'd been accepted to the program. I immediately went to talk to the building manager. I told her I was going to resume graduate school in Iowa, and I was be, I would be leaving by the middle of August. Now, mind you, this was 29 July. So I got rid of half of my books. I got rid of all of my furniture with the exception of my desk, which I gifted to Wally, and packed up a small U-Haul truck and moved to Fairfield, Iowa. But here's the rub. Had I not done so, had I not done the action and maintained my focus, I would not have been in Fairfield Monday, 1 December 2008, to sense Mina in the dining hall. And so I take a look at all of that in my own life. And this model is evidence of my own life and my own journey. And of course, the third column gets to the question of the outcomes. We have the known. We, we know from that first tier, we, the second tier, we have the evolving Mason as an outcome. The third tier produces compassion for everyone. The fourth tier produces an acceptance of change. This fourth, the, the fifth tier, an evolving sense of self. And the final tier in that column indicates a commitment to a higher purpose or calling. You begin to recognize by that time, you, by the time you reach that final panel, you've had enough experiences to know conclusively, without equivocation, that this is one, the right path I'm supposed to be on, two, that this is bigger than me, 
Three, that I am an instrument in the hands of the divine. And when it comes to Freemasonry, when you contemplate the rituals, you come to see that the great architect of the universe isn't just a term that's used, it is a reality and it becomes a part of one's life. And I posit as a result of the research that as we enfold, in this case, TM, within Masonic education, a deeper understanding will emerge, not just for the benefit of the person practicing the technique itself and the Mason, but the person with whom they come in contact as well. And so this you can look at the columns in this model in another way as well. Look at the first, the second two tiers. We have the fraternal, which is that is done amongst those who are you, you doing the work with them. You engaging in the deep study, you're engaging the conversations. You have the subtle desire, you are the seeker, you're the evolving, you're developing compassion. Uh, philomathy. And philomathy, I think, is a really powerful way to think about it because philomathy is to signify, as defined within the Greek language, a lover of learning and studying. Note the process element with this definition and is thus distinct from that of philosophy in that the soft suffix denotes wisdom or knowledge, while the math highlights the process for the acquisition thereof. And so that's one of the things I want us to think about as we look at this, this bridge uh, tier, if you will. And when we get into the philanthropic tier, the, the philanthropic, the final two tiers, it speaks to the activities of, of either a person, group, or an organization engaging in charitable or benevolent activities for the greater good. In delineating the five roles, above the role titled three in one structure of consciousness along the right side, for the model for perpetual growth of progress, we believe added gravitas is provided when contemplating the model as it relates to the Masonic fraternity, being, despite some brothers holding an, op an opposite opinion, primarily a philosophic fraternity. And this is one of the things I think is really powerful because we I refer to it as a philosophic fraternitatis, that at each level, the philosophic is there. And so you have the fraternal to, to highlight the philosophic is that you recognize that the brotherhood of all humans, that we're one, we come from the same source, we're governed by the same source. The philomathy, that aspect of, you know, loving of knowledge and, 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 and working with, that's the, the philosophic aspect of it that's permeating that aspect. And of course, the philanthropic, to engage in the philanthropic, you have to have an open heart and an open mind. And you, you recognize that you have the responsibility when you have a resource to assist others. And so while some brothers would say that you have the fraternal and they prefer to give primacy to the fraternal aspect of Freemasonry, some would say, I want to focus on the philanthropic and others would say the philosophic. I would say, number one, the philosophic permeates the entirety of Freemasonry. And it's more important to begin to harmonize the three as opposed to demarcating them. And the example I give is that of Maharshi. We talk about the example of the three-legged stool. You have the three-legged stool. You pull one leg. Let's say you pull the fraternal leg. You also, as you pull this stool across the floor, guess what? You're bringing with you the, fratern the, the fraternal. You have it held. You have also to the philanthropic and the philosophic. If you grab the uh, uh, philanthropic, you're pulling both the fraternal and the philosophic. If you grab the philosophic, you're pulling both the fraternal and the philanthropic. So you can't escape it. And so when we try to demarcate the craft and say that, oh, this is a, a philosophic mason or an esoteric mason, is a, and his term is used derisively, we're doing a disservice. We're doing a disservice to the craft and possibilities and the possibilities that are resident within us as humans. And so highlighting this model, and it wasn't until after I had uh, Wally, he took a look at it, and he highlighted that you realize this is like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I honestly did not realize it until afterward. And I had to, there's a part of the dissertation where I mentioned that, that it wasn't until my Iowa mentor mentioned this, that I recognized that within Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this model situates itself within the self-actualization transcendence portion of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which suggests then that those Masons who've engaged in this study, deep study of the craft itself and the ritual, have the time to do so. And in so doing, they themselves have become better and in becoming better, they go into the world and do better things. And that's where the model is situated. Now, in terms of the outcomes of this, and I just talk about this briefly, 
the ritual, which is the R in the center, is deposited within the open heart and open mind. And as we contemplate the ritual, we have these epiphanal moments, which then lead to our refined thinking and actions within the world itself. Now, this is with the Masonic ritual. And I'm positing that as we practice transcendental meditation and fold it into Masonic education, there's a subtle shift, a refinement, if you will, that occurs. And that occurs that the heart is more expanded. The mind is more expanded. We experience deeper ritual contemplations, increased epiphanal moments that we listen to and act on, even more refined thinking, and of course, even more refined actions, which then produce even more refined outcomes. That's the model for perpetual growth and progress that came out of the research as a result of examining it in light of Maharshi's unified field. And to close it, I'd like to simply say something that Albert Pike reminded us long ago, we have all the light we need, we just need to put it into practice. I took a little bit longer than anticipated, I apologize, but there's so much information. I want to stop the share. There's so much information, and I apologize for taking longer than anticipated. It was great, Baruti. Let's and start with any questions there. from the uh, committee. Karen, Dr. Aoki? Well, um, thank you, Baruti. It was very enjoyable to actually read your first draft, and then the, the one we incorporated the comments from everybody. And um, I was wondering if the specific aspect of transcendence was emerging to the ritual which is more of what we consider like going beyond any experience or if it was more what we would think of as a witnessing experience which is more of this cosmic consciousness i wasn't sure if you did that level of analysis correlating between the experiences of the rituals and the marshy's higher states model but um that's, is that a, a, part of, that's yeah. a great question i i i, I talked about in the dissertation that when we read through these experiences we want to be we don't without further research we can't correlate with the higher states of model as of yet because you know we don't know i mean I, we just it's just a, it's just kind of putting it out there but i can say that the masons that responded to the survey are clearly having experiences as to whether or not they would comport with the higher states model i can't say that definitively but what i can say is they're definitely having experiences and that would require additional research and that is something i'd like to look at at some point uh because the first step, however, is to take a look at those Masons who are practicing Transcendental Meditation or those who want to practice TM and note the differences that they experience within the ritual and understanding and what it, what it brings to their lives. I say that because the one Masonic respondent, you know, him being a TM teacher and then becoming a Mason, when I read that, it just kind of struck me as, okay, this is an area, an avenue for future research. And so I'd like to definitely take that into consideration at some point and maybe look at the higher states model in relation to the experiences. Thank you for that question. It's a great question. As, as a curiosity, because the word divinity would come out and sometimes it's it's an external point of reference and, and some for some it's an internal point of reference. Is Did that emerge whether the connection was sort of something grand was external or internal or? That, that's, that gets into, we had a normative sample. Uh, Anthony and his research uh, team they examined over 1,900 students that were Muslim, Hindu, and Christian. And I drew my normative sample from them to understand the differences between the populations. And what I found, they used introverted mysticism as a measure, extroverted mysticism as a measure, and religious interpretation. And what I found in the data is that religious interpretation was, was minor, but more introverted mysticism, meaning the attention is guided from within. Something is happening from, that's within as being predominant among Freemasons. Those respondents were very, it's very clear that it was an internal recognition, not an external thing of being, you know, this, it's, I'm, I'm this, this is all here and it's happening within me. Highlighting the importance of mind and the power of mind itself. And as we turn the attention within an inward, in an inward direction, and in the case of TM, transcending our thoughts, we come to have this fundamental level of awareness. And of course, you bring it with you into your daily life. And I suspect that to some degree that has happened and consistently happens with Freemasons because the ritual tells us we have these working tools within the craft to, it's often referred to as chip away the calcifications of our mind. And so as we begin to do so, we go from being this term of rough ashler to that of a smooth ashler. And so as you go through this process, there's a chipping away, if you will, there's a refinement that occurs. And that refinement occurs within our thinking because every action being preceded by a thought 
So it has to occur within. And so it's definitely introverted mysticism as opposed to being extroverted. Thank you for that question. Thank you for that question. Dr. G? I'm just so impressed with what you've done and the research and and it, particularly the expression so that I could understand what you were doing. I am just, I've just been so impressed. And so there's this beautiful knowledge on two different sides. Mm. And it just seems to me that they should be integrated. Mm -hmm. And how are you, how are you going to do that? That's a wonderful question. The idea, something Dr. Morris said when Tom had taken us, Dr. Eganis, for those who don't know, Tom had taken us to uh, out to Vedic City, and we had a session there. And Dr. Morris, he said, those of us who are doing PhDs in Vedic science, it's important that we think of books, not just, you know, writing a dissertation and having it sit on a library shelf somewhere. So this is going to be turned into a book. Uh, I've already spoken with a publisher to have this conversation. And there's another publisher that I'm going to approach as well about turning this into a book because this knowledge is present and you've got about 6 million Masons throughout the world. And you know, I, I have the good fortune to know a lot of the leaders within the Scottish Rite out of Washington, DC. And Art de Hoyas is a wonderful author, writer, and scholar for Albert Pike, which is also mentioned in the dissertation as well and to talk with him and Sean Iyer at the George Washington Memorial. He and I have been friends for years. And so the idea is to publish in a book, to have Masons think about this at a very deep level, deep and fundamental level, because Masons historically have served as leaders within society. And so Maharshi's idea of the highest first, I think comes out here because you go on with people who are leaders in society, presenting them the knowledge. They, as the one Masonic respondent indicated, you know, it's within Freemasonry. I've known it from my own experiences, but coupling transcendental meditation with it, it augments it even more so. And this gets into what Maharshi talks about in the science of being an art of religion, art of um, living, the value of religion, the real value of religion. And so when you fold TM into Freemasonry, com you know, combining the two, you can only augment. And it has done wonders for me, it's done wonders for those men who are Masons who come through and learn TM with us the 10 years we've been here, and so I suspect the same would be much more broadly as well. And so the idea is to publish it as a book, you know, taking a strong cue from Dr. Morris to publish it as a book and speak about it. So, I mean, consciousness is the only real game in the universe. DeRope talks about this and I'm affirmed. I accept it. Blake talks about it. And so the idea is to put it out there and have those Masons who are sympathetic or sympathetical in spirit to embrace it and take it on. So that's the idea, turn it into a book. Thank you. Great. And Dr. Raleigh, any comments? Any questions for Babriti? Can you hear me? Yes, yes we sir. Can. Okay. Um, first of all, let me uh, let me say uh, thank you, Baruti, um, for your presentation. Thank you for all of the hard work, um, years of uh, hard work to to get you to this point. I also want to uh, say thank you to uh, Dr. Travis and your other committee members for um, for taking you on as a, as a student and, and working with you. Um, nobody gets to this point um, without committed mentors and advisors and, and people who invest in your uh, development as a scholar. So, uh, so thank you to my colleagues. And, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. A couple of things that I just wanted to um, point out and then ask maybe a question or two. Um, one is, and I said this, um, to Baruti um, over time after he um, asked me if I would be, uh, be willing to serve as part of his committee. As I read the document, um, the earlier versions and this, um, this penultimate um, version, um, I was just really blown away um, and really grateful for what he achieved in three areas. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and give you some praise right now and then ask a few questions. Uh, you did a lot, a lot of reading. And based on the document itself, we know that this was not superficial reading. Um, and any intellectual uh, journey of the sort that you embarked upon 
requires deep reading, deep thinking, and reflecting. And so I want to thank you for uh, for being uh, a true seeker in terms of uh, the level of reading uh, in, in several uh, areas of literature. Um, the second thing is you did something really extraordinary conceptually. Um, and I think conceptually and in terms of synthesizing some really dense, uh, complex, and some people might think divergent literatures, you were able to see patterns and connections and linkages uh, to elucidate what you did uh, superbly in a third way, uh, and that's empirically. So in terms of in terms of your reading, in terms of the conceptual work, and in terms of the empirical work, either of those by themselves would have been a superb uh, contribution. And so you should be really, really, really proud of being able to conceptualize the study uh, the way that you did. Um, and then being able to find the connections and the linkages um, in order to synthesize those bodies of knowledge and those bodies of literature and research. But then I, I really want to highlight this, and I know uh, Baruti um, kind of thought of um, the, let's say, the least developed aspect of uh, of his abilities as, as he went along as a researcher was in the uh, statistical area. But what I always say is there's, there's, there's nothing more practical than a good theory. And so your theoretical work with assistance from some, uh, some folks who have the technical statistical expertise, if, if your conceptualization was not there, Baruti, then being able to operationalize and empirically explore and, um, and make some assertions from the, from the hood model, it never would have worked. Um, and I, I suspect Dr. Hood was really, really pleased and surprised to find that someone picked up um, his um, his measure uh, of mystical experiences and was going to empirically operationalize it and use it in a really beautiful and novel way. Um, so that, that's my praise. Um, the The first question I have for you, I suppose, is. Um, and some of this, I know, in, in uh, the revisions that you made, you, you began to clarify some of this. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, um, Baruti, as you think about those mystical experiences, um, part of the synthesis that you did was using several scholars who had written about mysticism or mystical kinds of experiences. You, of course, uh, have the unified field and Maharshi's overarching uh, approach uh, to the Vedic literature and, and TM. And then of course, you did a really, really nice job of creating uh, that model, um, which allowed us to, to begin to see how Freemasonry and Masonic thought and practice could be uh, utilized for a model for perpetual growth. But, but my, my question then is given, uh, that you're able to juxtapose much from the TM and Vedic uh, science literatures with Masonic thought and practice. What I would like you to maybe talk a little bit about is, can you say a little bit more about what came out of um, your, um, your data analysis in terms of Hood's framework? Because what I, what I think is gonna help you uh, and that you know, and there's no right or wrong answer to this. But what I think is going to really help you when you go out and talk to various audiences to make it parsimonious uh, mm -hmm. over against the way you have to do it to defend a dissertation is to be able <laughs> to take that sharp framework uh, that Hood has given you to allow you to operationalize, have some sound data, and then talk about Masonic thought and practice in the ways that you did and the principles that come out of, uh, and the actual practical outcomes that come out of, uh, of TM and the voluminous work that Maharshi did to show us that all these things are connected. So I, I'm just asking you to muse a little bit about what you learned from the empirical measure. I'm not asking you to wax statistical so much, but how is the hood framework uh, how do you find it being useful for the work that you did in the ways that I described? 
I find it essential. I find it as being essential. I mean, because I now know that, of course, we know that there are people who will argue against anything. But if I can point to the data and say, this is what is emerging, and it's not just with one group of Masons, it's with Masons across the board. I say that because with your introduction of um, the Prince Hall information, Charles H. Wesley's work, Prince Hall, Life and Legacy, thank you for that. It highlights that I can take this measure because I've had, I think, 12 Prince Hall Grand Lodges represented, or 10 Prince Hall Grand Lodges represented within the research. And so this wasn't demarcated in terms of like Prince Hall Masons or what I call PWLs, predominantly white lodges, it's Freemasonry as a whole. And I say that because Albert Pike gifted a copy of the Scottish Rite Rituals to you know, his friend who was Grand Lodge of, a Grand Lodge of, a Grand Master of Prince Hall at the time. And so when I look at this information, I sadly have to say that there are some in society <laughs> in terms of race and the construct of race, they want to demarcate folk. And so Freemasonry highlights that there's a universality there. The data speaks to and supports that universality. And that if people want to continue to, in their minds, demarcate society, they do so to their own peril. Because the reality is, I often say we're on this pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan refers to it as, we're all in the canopy of heaven. We're all governed and ruled by the, the exact same laws that govern and rule the universe. So to psychologically develop this idea that someone is inferior or, or superior <laughs> is nonsense, to put it mildly. And the data supports that. And so Hood's measure isn't about, we just use common parlance in America, black or white. It's about what the experiences are. And it highlights universal universality of the experiences. I say that because Dr. King was actually, there, there were meetings that were trying to be developed where Dr. King and Maharshi could actually meet one another. And this was written about in 1968 when Dr. King uh, was assassinated. There's an Ebony magazine that you can find. Dr. King's on the front of it. And it actually has within the magazine Meditation can solve the race problem. This mm. is an article that was published in the exam. And I was blown away when I purchased the magazine. I got it on eBay. I heard about it years ago and I purchased it. And I used the article in my class because it highlights the universality. So to your point, not unlike we learn in terms of pure consciousness, everyone can experience pure consciousness in, in, via transcendental meditation. That's been shown. We now know that in terms of the data, what Hood's measure does, it removes this discussion. And my argument, you know, puts it soundly in a trash bin somewhere about people being demarcated because of the color of their skin, because everyone has the inherent right to experience pure consciousness because they come from it. And as a result of that, Hood's measure highlights it conclusively that all can have the experience. And that's why I don't use the term that most will use, historically I used it until I came to this research, using for predominantly white lodges, I refer to them in the dissertation, historically they were referred to as mainstream lodges, which tosses up a line of demarcation between Prince Hall Freemasons and predominantly white lodges. So I use the term predominantly white lodges because that's what they were. I mean, we get into the history of that. We know, however, here in Massachusetts, for example, when Prince Hall, he actually approached uh, Joseph Warren about becoming, you know, you know, getting a permit to actually make Masons and get... So, of course, we know that didn't happen because of uh, Warren being killed at Bunker Hill. But I also included in dissertation, mm. Lodge of St. Andrew. They actually have Thorndike. They were all responsible for this. And there's the documents there that, you know, Prince Hall petitioned, you know, Joseph Warren. And so we have this history here. And so there was this, 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 um, this amiableness between Prince Hall Masons and Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, more specifically St. Andrews. Lodge of St. Andrews that was there. And in, uh, as a matter of fact, Prince Hall in his charge, 1797, he referred to the Boston men as being better bred as opposed to all the attacks that were happening at the time. He made a clear line of demarcation to say that it wasn't the Boston people. It was those who were recently themselves were in manumission. They were recently servants in households. They were basically washing dishes and keeping a household. He made it very clear in his charge. 
So for me, Hood's measure removes this idea that only a particular group of people can have a specific experience. And it does it conclusively. And that's what I love about the measure. And I'm looking forward to applying it much more broadly as the research continues to see, you know, what other Prince Hall Masons are experiencing and, and some of their experiences and what they're experiencing. Because it's clear that it's there because we know within the Vedic science tradition that everyone can experience pure consciousness. We all come from it. And TM affords that opportunity. We know that Freemasonry affords the opportunity, what I'm seeing in terms of the research. And Hood's measure gives us an opportunity to actually delve into that much more deeply and look at the numbers and not the color. That's what I love about it. Did I answer your question, Dr. Riley? Um, yeah, and then some, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 have, I have one suggestion, and we can certainly um, uh, later on uh, down the road uh, talk about this. Um, one of the things that I think all of us know um, uh, living in the United States and uh, and knowing the history of um, countless forms of division, we also know that we have been bequeathed uh, some some language uh, in our in our in our civic documents, uh, the mm -hmm. civic scriptures, uh, if you will, um, that point us to to universality. And the thing that I will I will push you to do, Baruti. Um, because you're better equipped than than most to be able to do this, is because you're now conversant and pretty much expert in these various different traditions. Um, you know, Prince Hall versus uh, predominantly white uh, Freemasonry, um, uh, the TM tradition versus Masonic traditions, um, the the notion of Vedic science. And uh, to a lesser degree, and I know this wasn't a part of your, your study, but uh, you're pretty well versed in a variety of philosophical and religious traditions. And so what I'm going to encourage you to do, and I think, uh, I think Dean Carter uh, would chime in here, is in talking to these various different audiences um, that you will want to uh, share your, your research and your scholarship with going forward, is to begin in your own mind. Now, I know you want to promote uh, TM for all the benefits that it can bring, but I also think you're going to need to find universal language so that these commonalities and the universality across these various different organizations and traditions and racial and cultural groups is to begin to find a universal language so that you can share from the various different traditions with individuals and groups in language that they can grasp, right? And so that's going to be different than the big, huge tone that this dissertation is likely to become. But you're going to have to refine that so that when you move across these various different spaces, and this is really why I want to say this to the committee. This is really why I want to really, really push Baruti um, to incorporate um, cultural knowledge that he already knew about that he had not fleshed out quite as fully as he could. And it's not just about race, but it's about his own experiences. Yes. He spent a lot of time in Atlanta hanging out with wonderful people like Dean Carter. He was at, you know, hanging around Emory Library, I'm sure sometimes, at the AA, uh, I mean, at the AU Center, mm -hmm. uh, at Morehouse, at Georgia State. And so uh, for him to be able to, to bring his full self, his full history, and his full experience into this scholarship, I, I thought that that would, it would not just be race vindication, but it would be making the point that his entire study and the traditions that he was drawing from had been making all along. Yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very uh, grateful um, that, that, um, that he would um, follow some of the um, suggestions that I made. Well, I thank have to say, thank, thank you. Thank you. It's in the thank you for, I, I need to interrupt you for, here. Thank you. I made a, yes, Dr. Raleigh, thank you for your input now and also for his dissertation. I made a big mistake in a four o'clock meeting I had has been moved up to 3.30. <laughs> so what I asked Baruti, if you could uh, put myself and Karen and Kathy and, and Larry into a breakout room. Um, I, I Dr. don't have Carter, to put you in a breakout room. I think you can uh, on dots. Uh, where is it located? 
breakout room? At the bottom, it uh, could be in the three dots on the bottom. I see pause recording, stop recording, AI companion. Oh. Notes, whiteboards, reflections, participants, security. Let's yeah, I don't have I don't ability. think it's in the preferences. Oh, okay. I don't I don't have that ability. So how should we do this? Um, well the rest of us could sign off, I suppose. Uh, right, I would love to chat right. with Baruti, but but yeah. The necessity or, is for you all to talk. Or, or we could do it where if um Dr. Travis, if you have um Zoom account, you can send a quick email to Dr. Quadir, Dr. Rowley, Dr. Garini, and the four of you could connect. And then once you conclude your conversation, then I can just you come back and then I can admit you and I can have a conversation with everyone else while you do yes, that. Yes, yes. I like that better because Dr. Carter and Dr. Coleman, I think, want to speak with you. First, I do apologize, Dr. Carter and Dr. Coleman. I'd want to be part of that conversation myself. <laughs> Thank you for all that you've given to Baruti. Uh, for the committee, um, I'll be in this meeting to about 4.30. Uh, Eastern time, and we can. I can either send you a uh, Zoom link then, or we could do it in the evening. Is four thirty good? Yes. Oh, in an hour. In an hour. Okay. Kathy. Yeah, and Dr. Raleigh. Okay, good. So that's what we we'll do. Well done, Brudy. This was such a magnificent demonstration of your deep inner experience of who you are, uh, both as an unbounded field of liveliness, of creativity, and also who you are as a Mason, as a TM teacher, as a father. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So, thank good. You. So I thank see you. the rest of you at 4.30. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Dr. Cutler. Okay. Thank you so very much for this invitation. I'm a little embarrassed because in one hour now, my chapel service begins at Morehouse, and I have a good distance to drive. Mm -hmm. But you have thoroughly convinced me that you will be the first person invited to deliver a lecture at Morehouse on all of your work. And this is something that is greatly requested, and I have not known in 44 years who to invite to do this. Mm -hmm. The prayer has been answered. <laughs> mm -hmm. Excellent. I'm about to get emotional. Um, <laughs> thank you, Dean Carter. Well, I didn't mean to make you cry, but, <laughs> but I assume those are tears of joy. Here, here, go ahead and cry. It's all right. <laughs> You're in the thank church. You. Go ahead and cry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Carter. We will talk. I'll call you later this evening. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mm. Could I make just a quick comment, Baruti? Yes, please. Thank you. I, I absolutely loved your dis your presentation, and I'm really looking forward to going through the dissertation itself. When I um years ago in the early 70s, I had a TM center that was right next to the um, George Washington Memorial oh. Masonic Lodge in Alexandria. Um, it's a huge, huge structure with a big tower, and yeah. it, it's more of a museum than a, than a lodge, I think. But it was beautiful. But I, when I used to go through it, I used to walk through it, and, and it didn't seem, maybe I missed it, but I it, I didn't seem to see much of the deeper philosophical aspects of, of masonry. I, I saw a lot of the sort of the peripheral elements, who was a mason, what presidents the U.S. were masons and all that, but I didn't see any of the stuff that I really liked. And, and after listening to your dissertation, I couldn't help but wonder, you know, your plans for a book and speaking are absolutely fabulous. I think writing books is one of the best ways to get knowledge out because it lasts. Mm -hmm. um, but I wondered what other kind, if you have any other career plans, any other thoughts of what you'll do when you're finished with your dissertation? Are you going to continue in Cambridge yes. uh, teaching TM where you've done just absolute wonders? I've, I've been in awe of what you've accomplished, uh, you know, over the years that you've been there. It's just spectacular. But I just wonder what, what your thoughts were for, for your future. Well, the idea is no matter where we are in the world is to continue to teach TM. That's number one, because I think it's important. Number two, um, I, I have a sneaking suspicion that, you know, I will continue to teach at the university level as well. And I, I have, that's, you know, I, others have already mentioned that they were waiting for me to finish. 
Mm. <laughs> and so I have a sneaking suspicion that my my wife, Mina, she often says, so you do realize that people are going to start asking you to not only come speak, but also to serve as scholar in residence as well because of the research. And so mm -hmm. I'm definitely open to that. So the idea is to definitely have a base here in Cambridge, and no matter where we go in the world, we'll always have a base here in Cambridge because of, you know, we love Cambridge and Cambridge has tremendously contributed to the dissertation in ways that I couldn't even imagine. But the fact that we were here, the dissertation has become what it has become. If we had been, uh, if we had not been here, it wouldn't be what it has been. It wouldn't be, there's just no question at all. Cause I would not have met uh, Right Worshipful Jarzebek. We are members within what became the Masonic Legacy Society, uh, November, 2019. We were invited to, he's here in Massachusetts, mind you. We were invited to uh, this event at Fe in Phoenix. And as we were introducing ourselves that evening during dinner, Massachusetts, we're like Massachusetts. And we realized we'd been in some of the same rooms, but had not met in Massachusetts. So we had to go to Phoenix to actually meet. Mm -hmm. And our friendship now over four years, this November has blossomed as a result of that. And so the opportunity to to continue to speak about this research and he's provided a lot of opportunities and has touted the model you know and talked with others within grand lodge and other places as well about the emergent model and i'll be speaking on it in other cities as well amongst masons and more broadly also because the model has applicability across the board it has really universal applicability and that it emerged from that. And of course, coming from Maharshi's unified field chart is just phenomenal to think about it. And so Maharshi, you know, I, I'm told he understood Freemasonry. He knew that Vivekananda was a Mason. And I'm told he pointed out certain aspects of Freemasonry that comes from the Vedic tradition as well. So it's, you know, that I get a chance to participate in an, in an international conversation on consciousness as it relates to Freemasonry. It's heady and cool at the same time. So so I'll be doing that moving forward and for the rest of my life. This is this is the path that, you know, I, I can say it chose me because I say Vedic science chose me. I didn't know about Vedic science until I called and spoke with Ela one evening after receiving information from the David Lynch Foundation about coming to Fairfield to learn about the programs there. And then of course, when I went to the website, you know, all this happened. So all this happened because I had the good sense to listen to my, my inner voice to tell me to not only call, not only send an email, but also to call as well. And so, yeah, I'll be doing this for a long time. I'll be doing this for a good. long time. But yeah. Well, you have a beautiful future and congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Sanders. Thank you. Dr. Yes, yes, Cole, yes, yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was an extraordinary, <laughs> extraordinary presentation. And uh, um, I just want to also follow up on, because I've been thinking about it the entire time, something that uh, Dr. Raleigh said, and that is, I want to give thanks to your grandfather. Yes. Who was a Mason. Yes. And I want you to give thanks to your grandfather, who was a Mason. Yes. Because... Uh, just as you are synthesizing components of TM and masonry, I would encourage you to meditate on how he synthesized mm. his position in African-American spiritual culture yes. and masonry. In traditional Prince Hall masonry, many, 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 many masons were also officers in African-American churches. You know this. Yes. Know? Absalom Jones, you know Richard Allen, you know Prince Hall. Yes. So uh, I would be very surprised if your father also was not an officer in an African American church. He was. And that was the mysticism. Yeah, he was. That was his ecstatic yeah. mysticism. Yes. And to fold that into, that's who you are. I mean, yeah. you, in a sense, are fulfillment of a dream deferred for him mm. and his generation. Thank Don't you. forget that. Yes, he's yes. here now at this defense because he's in you. Thank you. And you're speaking for him in a way that he could not speak for himself mm. at that time. Thank you. So going Thank forward, you. as as you've heard others say, it's extraordinary to hear you all, the two of you <laughs> in this instance, do this presentation and that your roots are deep, deep, deep in a multiplicity of traditions now you have a multiplicity of multilingual 
and you, you, you have yet to really test that out. As, as we all know, you're still in the process of the PhD mindset, the PhD real, reality. There's another brother Baruti to be born past this. Mm. That's the one that we're waiting to hear from, who's inclusive of this moment, but way beyond, way, way, way beyond it. I'll be calling on you too. And you know you got to respond to me because I'm yelling, so you won't have a choice. But I just want to say, Modupe Pupo, thank you. We thank you very much. The ancestors, thank you. We continue to do this great work that others have not been able to do this way. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I will. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I you know, does anyone else have any questions, points of reflections, or comments? I, I just. You know, Dr. Mapayan, yes, please. Um, I do, and I, I can't really um, say more in terms of laudatory remarks than my predecessors in this conversation, particularly Dr. Raleigh and uh, Dr. Coleman, um, in terms of the work that I know went into this and the incredible degree of synthesizing. But I want to make a point that I'm sure you'll get the minute I mention it, I'm going to come in as a developmental psychologist, mm -hmm. that the model you've presented is really um, in the spirit of Erickson and Jung, like um, a very complex model of adult development that I think takes uh, that um, line of inquiry further, because I think part of what psychology needs to do, but has a hard time doing, is moving its models into something that can acknowledge the spiritual reality that the most advanced thinkers of the human race have already connected with. Because of a secular bias, it's really hard to um, mount theories that acknowledge that part of us that is part of universal consciousness or that tunes into the invisible world. And I think that your model provides a gateway and it does it, as you say, with a kind of universalism that people from different traditions and no tradition can relate to. Because your language, while acknowledging spiritual traditions, doesn't have any flavor of, you know, like religiosity per se. And so I think that doing that work of building those on ramps for people from different traditions to see this simply as a model of more evolved ev adult development that the human race needs right now, um, I think is another piece of work that you could potentially do. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure you see the connections immediately. Um, you know, but it's a very well thought out, it, I would say it's both a descriptive and a prescriptive model of highly evolved adult development that if more people were exposed to, they would also see pathways for helping to shape the social context so that more people can engage in that way. So mm -hmm. I'll stop there, but that was something that really impressed me about your work and I hope has the opportunity to be developed over time. Thank you, Dr. Mupari. I, I truly appreciate your longstanding support and energy, uh, just your friendship over the years. Thank you. I truly appreciate you being here today. It means a tremendous amount. So, so thank you. Thank you for that. And I Very agree well. with you 100% and uh, look forward to doing just as you've suggested. I thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just see. want to say that I have, I have seen you grow so much in the years and you really are an authority now. You have a voice. Uh, you are the one that has this knowledge. And it's just a beautiful thing. You can just go forward as Baruti, doctor, and be the authority. So it's it's just a beautiful, beautiful transition. That's Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. G. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. G. Thank you. Michael? I just want to thank you for letting me for for letting me attend today, and you know I'm always blown away by your preparation in these moments and your and the the ease that you gave. Like I mentioned to my wife who was sitting in the car next to me as we were coming back. I said I don't know how he's so calm, cool, and collected right now. I I just don't get it. Like he's it's like he's just having a conversation, and it's just amazing the the level of preparation that that you bring to this and the professionalism that you bring to this. And the one thought that I had after Dr. Rowley made his comments was that in terms of, in terms of this work and the spirituality and 
and spirituality, you are doing today what John McClendon did at the University of Iowa when he proved that there was no physiological difference between the races. Um, and he proved that to disprove the racism against Jesse Owens. And now you're doing it with this work. And I think it's beautiful. Oh, that, thank you. That McClendon, wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And he you. gave us a tool, right? Like he gave us tools and that you're doing the same thing. You're giving men, a tool, men and women a tool for which they can better themselves. And so I think it's definitely that you're within that vein with this work. Thank you for that. And I, that's, wow, thank you. I, I truly appreciate your friendship and your saying that. It's, it means a lot. And I look forward to working with you as we continue to do this work. So this is it's gonna continue to be fun. So thank you for that. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Let's see, are there any additional thoughts, questions or reflections anyone would like to share? Hearing none, I, I want to say thank you to each of you for your pouring into me at various stages of my own growth and evolution. You know, I would not be here today were it not for each of you. And I know Dr. Sands and I've only had minimal conversations over the years, but I've, I've read your, your book, uh, Maharshi's Gift to the World. So I want to say thank you. And I actually cite it in the dissertation as well. It's actually in there. So oh, when you showed up today, I was like, whoa. <laughs> so, so. So thank you for that. And um, Wally, I mean, Wally, I, I want to say thank you for being here. I mean, I met Wally uh, when I was preparing to do the advanced techniques course, the TM City program, when I went over to the Men's Peace Palace and I saw his ring. And I said, I have a mentor that has a ring like that, Dr. Coleman. So Wally, this is Dr. Coleman. Dr. Coleman, this is Wally. And uh, when I started talking with Wally, he and I immediately hit it off and became fast friends and just a phenomenal human being. And when I shared the model with him, he's the one who said that it was reminiscent of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so, Dr. DeVazier, I want to say thank you for your friendship and continued support and just everything because it's kind of cool. And I just also want to say that uh, he was actually my top line signer when I became a Mason as well, along with Lindsay, who was in the mailroom has since transitioned. Uh, they were my signers to become Masons in Clinton Lodge 15. Uh, oh, Sylvia Rivera. Oh my gosh, she's joining. Oh my gosh, this is the end, but I'll let her in. So yeah, I want to say thank you for that because it just, you know, it, it's it's cool that it's been 15 years now and how it's all worked out and how you know, you're here today. And so it's actually pretty cool. So, so thank you for that. Um, Sylvia, thank you for joining us. How are you? I am wonderful. What an amazing, amazing privilege to be here with you, Baruti. Oh. What I, I just learned about the, the e I saw the email, but I didn't open it and I'm cooking. And when I, when <laughs> I, you know, and I remember that it's you and I thought, let me get on, I'll turn on my video momentarily so I can say hello well, you look so you amazing, that. so beautiful. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, we're just Jake wrapping it up. Jake, mm -hmm. up. thank you. And I just say like, beautiful to have you here. So thank you for being here. It's really appreciative of your mm. energy. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being so here. much love. Take good care. Thank you. You as mm -hmm. well. Well, I, I just want to say thank you to everyone. And um and I know Dr. Travels will have a meeting with each of you with uh, uh Dr. Garini, Dr. Kudir and Dr. Rowley. So I, I look forward to learning the results of that meeting, but thank you for everything. I just, you know, I'm looking forward to continuing to share this information much more broadly. I really am because it's, I think it's needed and something Maharshi said about responding to the needs of the time. And I, I quoted the dissertation that there are several other thinkers who have echoed similar sentiments and one point what I'm about to read comes from Foster Bailey's famous book, The Spirit of Masonry. And I think it's apropos in terms of the research. He says, what a man gets out of masonry depends on what he puts into it by living a Masonic daily life. The riches of masonry are gained by those who recognize masonry as a way of life characterized by growth and knowledge and wisdom about essential life values. These include honesty, kindness, justice, 
and usefulness to others in practical ways. They bring poise and serenity in the midst of turmoil, suffering and fear. By Masonic living, when rightly understood, we become masters of our own destiny. A master Mason is essentially a master of himself. Greatest Masonry has been in the past. It has before it still a more glorious and useful future as it moves from speculative to spiritual Masonry. That inevitable change is already dimly seen. It will be more important than the change from operative to speculative Masonry. It is toward this end that Masonic research should direct its efforts. And so I'd like to close with that because when I <laughs> reread the book during this process, I realized that in some way this dissertation is contributing to the, just what Foster Bailey has called forth to be done. And I look forward to, as mentioned earlier, to sharing this much more broadly with others beyond, within and beyond the Masonic community and discussing TM and consciousness moving forward. And so thank you to each of you for pouring into me. Thank you for your energy today. It is truly beautiful. And I will, once I hear back from the committee, I'll be sharing on social media. Um, but I wanted to say thank you for each of you being here today. It's been a pleasure and an honor. And I am grateful for your presence and your energy. So thank you. Text me. Text me. Says soon. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> text me. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.